We have a telephone from the Secretary of State's Office Legal Counsel, Deke Kersey. Deke, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Great to have you with us. <laughs> Followed by dead air. <laughs> dead air. Glad, glad to be here. Thanks for me. <laughs> hey, Deke, before we get started, I do have a question uh, for you. Is Deke a nickname or is that your given name? It is a nickname. I am, uh, I'm Donald the Third, but both the Donalds were still alive when I was named, so they gave me a nickname. It's actually my dad's alma mater. It's a little school in North Carolina called Wake Forest, and their mascot is the Demon Deacon. So I guess his fraternity brothers were put the pressure on him because he was one of the first to have a kid out of college. So that's where I got it. Did you uh, happen to catch the Pitt Wake Forest game, Deke? I caught the score. Uh, yeah, the, at the end of that game, the quarterback for Pitt was scrambling for a first down that would have a bootleg that would have sealed the game. And he had the first down by a yard. He went into his slide, and they marked him back a yard short for starting his slide before the stick. And that gave uh, Wake Forest the ball back. And then they won on the uh, literally like a last, uh, I think it was two seconds left. Mm-hmm. They had a, you know, a pass in the end zone. But all Another because reason of the to slide. never root for Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Pittsburgh, so I was watching that game. Not rooting for Wake Forest, by the way. Uh, Deke, we had uh, Delegate Larry Kump on the program earlier this morning. We were getting into some potential homeowners association legislation the legislature may tackle in January. And he mentioned the fact that homeowners associations fall under the guidelines of the Secretary of State's office. Can you explain how that works? Sure. Uh, It's actually fairly light in code where the Secretary of State has any authority. Um, As you know, we are the records keeper and the uh, registrant for all businesses, nonprofits, uh, legal entities, including voluntary associations. Uh, Homeowners associations are like a subsect of the voluntary association code. They actually have their own provision of code right now. It's called the Uniform Common Interest Ownership Act. And basically what it says is, If a group of unit owners or household owners want to get together and prescribe their own kinds of bylaws that they all have to abide by, rules, regulations, things of that nature, they can do so. Um, They would simply file as some legal entity with our office, and uh, we would keep the paperwork. And if somebody needs to see who's in charge or who the officers are, um, we would have that information. But that's the extent of our current authority. Uh, homeowners associations are, for all intents and purposes, self-governing like a corporation. I did a quick search earlier, and we have uh, various different types of homeowners associations, uh, but it seems the vast majority of them are nonprofit corporations or voluntary associations. Different associations – this is John Gilstrap <clears throat> – different associations will have um, – enforcement structure such as you know fines if if you don't do this or if you put something in your front yard or, or whatever the case may be are those enforceable under west virginia law and by what means uh, well i it would depend on how the uh the bylaws are written but the short answer is yes but it would be through contract law most likely if you're a a, a new home buyer and you come into an organ a homeowner association when you're looking for a house um, you have to be told that there's an HOA, and if you uh, uh, once you get a, a copy of the document, the governing documents, you're making an informed decision, or it's presumed you're making an informed decision, that when you buy a home in this neighborhood, you are agreeing to being part of the homeowners association and bound by its rules and regulations, which would include any kind of uh, remedial procedures like arbitration or mediation or a, a board hearing. Um, and any fines and fees associated with any uh, violation of those rules. But, Dick, as I understand it, from the Secretary of State's office, your function is strictly administrative. You have no regulatory uh, impact whatsoever. Is that correct? That's exactly right. We are a ministerial office just like we would be for any other corporation or nonprofit or voluntary association. We keep the records. We make sure that they have the paperwork they need to exist legally, but we don't enforce any of their bylaws or regulations. Those are self-governing, and if they can't do it internally, they'd have to go to a court. And the recourse, they do not have all the paperwork in. Uh, what does the, If they do not adhere to your regulations, what do you do? We don't do anything. Uh, There's no penalty for not being registered as a homeowners association. Uh, What that means is the group, the group's authority to enforce its bylaws or regulations may be in question if it ever gets to that point. Let's say a homeowner doesn't pay their fee to have the road, uh, the snow removed from the road, 
every winter, and then the HOA goes to collect a couple hundred bucks, and they refuse to pay. Well, if they sue them and go to court to collect on those fees that are due, uh, the person who didn't pay may bring part of their as part of their defense. Well, they don't even exist legally. They can't enforce uh, their bylaws because they don't even have a, a legal structure. Uh, so it'll be up to a court to decide whether or not that's a, a winning argument. But that's how I would think it would play out. That's interesting, right? Yeah. Didn't register, not official. So, so in that circumstance, you're talking about sp- spending at least two hundred dollars to get two hundred dollars. Well, yeah, uh, that, that could be the case. If it's uh, if it's less than ten thousand dollars, you can go to magistrate court, which I think is a little cheaper. But um, and two hundred may be low for an HOAC. I know some places, especially around the ski towns, they're pretty expensive. But I gather then, it's uh, as your office, Secretary of State, you do not go out bugging people, or bugging HOAs to that you have not uh, updated your paperwork, or is that just kind of a uh, 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 you, you don't get involved one way or the other? No, we we don't get involved uh, actively or proactively. We're here to help and provide assistance and documents if they need to register or need to know what to do to register and keep up to date. But if there's ever a dispute over the bylaws, they have to resolve that in the court. The bylaws procedures or go to court. Well, then what's to enforce an association for having enough reserves to cover what it is supposed to be in charge of? So, for instance... Let's say that we keep our homeowners association dues incredibly low for as long as possible, and then all of a sudden the big road repair bill comes up, and we don't have two hundred thousand dollars to fix the roads in our association. So we send out a letter and says we're going to assess every homeowner five thousand dollars. You got to pay it by this date because we got to fix our roads. If I'm a homeowner, I'm I'm thinking, well, wait a second, that's irresponsible management. Now you're hitting me with a huge bill when uh, this should have been something we should have all been contributing to for over the years uh, to build up a reserve fund for this? It's a good question. Um, I've never dealt with this, but I would guess, and this is a guess, the way that would play out is first you'd have to look and see what you agreed to when you signed up uh, for the HOA or when you bought a home in the neighborhood that's subject to the HOA. And if there's terms about increasing fees for things that uh, the common interest uh, group uh, benefits from, like a new road, or needs, like uh, uh, replacing a culvert or something like that, um, you'd have to look at the bylaws and see what your recourse might be. I think uh, strongly that any time a decision like that is made, it has to be a formal decision of the legal entity, like a vote by the board of directors. And those meetings have to be noticed to some extent. And the homeowners have to be made aware of the decision that's going to be made and they have an opportunity to show up at the meeting um, held in the, the leader of the HOA's basement or wherever they have their meetings and uh, have an opportunity to have their voice heard. And if they dispute the, uh, the action by the HOA, follow the guidelines and the bylaws for how to, to dispute that formally. And if there aren't any, um, I suppose they'd have to just go to court. We've grilled you enough on homeowners associations, Deke. This is uh, not the reason why we invited you on the program today, but we appreciate you playing along there. Uh, yeah, no, glad to do it. Uh, one last thing I'll mention: there's a there's an association of homeowners associations, yes. uh, and they uh, the the person in charge, the last person in charge, I'm aware of her name is Nance Briscoe, yes. and she has a wealth of knowledge on HOAs. And anytime we get questions like this on HOAs, if I can't answer them. I'll send them over to Nance, and she typically resolves it because I never hear back from them. We've had Nance on the program before. Uh, she is uh, wonderful with this information. I invited her on the program again regarding uh, pending legislation, and, and once we get an official a piece of legislation we can dissect, she's going to come back on the program to discuss it with us. Uh, let's talk about uh, the reason why we invited you on the show, which was the follow-up from a previous appearance in regards to what precludes a person from running for office, what type of uh, either misdemeanor or felony infractions uh, would uh, preclude me from running for office, for instance, if I had some issues with the law, Deacon. I know Bill put together a list of questions we forwarded to you. And there's actually two parts to this. There's uh, running for what office you can hold, what are the restrictions between either a felony or a misdemeanor. The other part is voting. Uh, When can you, uh, what would preclude you from voting either during misdemeanor or felony? So there's actually four, four different issues we'd like to talk about. All right. Well, I'll I'll start off with uh, we'll, we'll try and go top down. At the federal level, uh, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, 
has uh, some very restrictive language on eligibility to seek and hold office at the federal level, um, specifically for president and for uh, Congress. It's the 14th Amendment in Section 3, and it, it says essentially that you can't be a member of Congress or president or vice president if uh, you have engaged in insurrection or rebellion uh, or given aid or comfort to the enemies of the United States. Now, there's an exception to that, which has been used it's, – it's been 150 years uh, – that says that Congress can, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, actually pardon someone who has committed insurrection or rebellion or given aid or comfort to those engaging in insurrection or rebellion. So that's a lifetime ban from serving in Congress or as president or vice president. Um, what's tricky is that's playing out right now in a couple dozen states. Litigation has been filed, including West Virginia, uh, by different plaintiffs seeking to prohibit uh, President Trump from running for office uh, based on this section of the Constitution. What's interesting is uh, we have a federal criminal law that defines insurrection specifically, and it's a very specific section of code. And all the activities that occurred on January 6th to date, nobody was actually convicted of that I'm aware of, convicted of, quote, insurrection. Um, most of the convictions were for entering capital grounds without authority or um, the equivalent of vandalism, um, things like that. Nobody's actually been convicted of insurrection, and that's according to the Congressional Research Service, and that, but that's a few months old, so there may have been a conviction since then. But only one person in the country I'm aware of who held a current – or held a public office that took place in the January 6th uh, activities was removed from office because of those activities, um, and that was a guy named Cooey Griffin out of New Mexico. And it was a state court decision, and the state said his activities, while not, quote, insurrection specifically under federal law, were the equivalent of insurrection. And so he was removed from his office as a county commissioner. So that is the same kind of logic and analysis that some of the plaintiffs are seeking in these uh, uh, Trump cases is to find him ineligible under the 14th Amendment uh, because of his uh, uh, activities on January 6th. So that's the federal level. Coming down to the state level, um, we have a constitutional ban um, in legislature for – and this is a lifetime ban if you're – if a person is convicted of bribery – perjury or, quote, other infamous crimes. Now, we have some case law in West Virginia that has defined that phrase, other infamous crimes, as a felony. So not just crimes of moral turpitude, but any felony crime. So if you've been convicted of any felony in West Virginia or if you've been convicted of bribery or perjury, you are lifetime ineligible from seeking or holding uh, a seat in the legislature. That's the most restrictive we have. For constitutional officers like governor, secretary of state, attorney general, auditor, um, you're ineligible from holding or seeking office while, you're, while your sentence is currently being served. So um, if you were convicted of a felony and you have a, a three-year incarceration period and then five years of probation or parole, you're ineligible for that entire period until your sentence is fully served. Does that also apply for misdemeanor? Misdemeanor, no, okay. except for one particular misdemeanor, and that is bribery in an election. It's Western Code 3913, which defines bribery in an election. Um, it doesn't use those terms, but that's basically what it is. And uh, uh, that's the only misdemeanor I'm aware of, at least in Chapter 3, um, that you could be convicted of and then prohibited from um, – holding office or voting, um, but that's only until your sentence is up, and misdemeanor doesn't carry more than a one-year period of incarceration. I believe, and I, I don't know the criminal code that well, but I believe you can also get uh, sentenced of uh, post-incarceration, probation, or, or parole. Um, supervised release is a little bit different um, and governed by a different section of code, so I don't think that covers it. But uh, if you have a period of probation after a misdemeanor conviction, you could also you would also be barred during that. But that's the only misdemeanor. Does the bribery include offering the bribe or just receiving the bribe? 
bribe. It's both. Um, <laughs> if you receive the bribe, that's the misdemeanor. If you offer the bribe, it's actually a felony. Huh. Mm. So, so taking the bribe is less than offering the bribe. Correct. In in the election context, it's election bribery. Well, yes. I'm, I'm going to roll the dice and take the cash then, Deke. <laughs> I can pay the fine with the cash I got from the bribe. There you go. That, well, I don't encourage that, but uh, <laughs> I understand. It. Uh, so that's that's your con- those are your constitutional offices. Uh, what's interesting in uh, Chapter Six of the Code it talks about state officers. If you're convicted of uh, a felony um, while in office, it creates an immediate vacancy, which is different than other offices, um, such as county commission. If you're convicted of felony, uh, county commissioner. Um, there is uh, uh, excuse me, if you're convicted, not county commission. If you're convicted of a felony as another officer, like let's say mayor or something, uh, the immediate vacancy actually has to occur through the removal process. There's a, a, a contest period after an election, and then after that, you hold office until you're removed. And um, the mechanism to do that is six six seven of the code. Um, so it's it's it, I guess my point is it really depends on the office of whether or not um, the particular types of crimes would preclude you from currently um, maintaining in your duties until you're removed and from seeking the office in the future. Um, one caveat: judicial offices uh, are governed by the same rules. Um, current felons can't can't run, can't serve, but once you're done. Once your sentence is served, you are eligible to run, except for magistrate. I don't know why this is, but uh, magistrates have a lifetime ban if they're convicted of a felony or any misdemeanor involving moral turpitude. Moral turpitude has been defined by various courts and judges uh, uh, and legal scholars. And in West Virginia, basically what that means is crimes against individuals that involve some sort of deceit or um, uh, malintent. Uh, things like that, not prima facie crimes, but like embezzlement or uh, uh, violence, things like that. So that does not include judges, but does include magistrates? Right. Magistrate judges expressly are prohibited from holding office if they've been convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor involving moral turpitude. But I have not, I couldn't find the same prohibition for circuit court judges or Supreme Court judges or intermediate, intermediate courts of appeals judges. Is it possible they meant as magistrates all those who sit on the bench when they wrote that? I don't think so uh, because it's Chapter 50, which is magistrate courts specifically. Family court judges, circuit court judges, Supreme Court judges, they have their own section of code. So the legislators and the magistrates uh, are the most restrictive of any other elected officials, correct? Um. As yeah, far as the life on the lifetime ban, yeah, yeah, that's that's my point. I'm sorry, lifetime ban. Yeah. All right. What was next on your checklist, Bill? My, was voting. How does this apply to voting? It's very similar. Um, your your authority, your excuse me, your ability to participate in an election by both being registered and casting a ballot um, are are based on your eligibility. Uh, that the Constitution requ- uh, prescribes, which is you have to be a resident of the state, you have to be a U.S. citizen, you have to be at least 18 years old by the general election, and you cannot currently be serving a sentence for a felony, uh, a misdemeanor election bribery, uh, or any period of probation or parole uh, from either one of those. So uh, what's different here is when you're convicted of a felony, for example, you uh, automatically get your rights restored once your sentence is done. You don't have to go apply to the, the governor or your prosecuting attorney like you would to have a record expunged um, or to get clemency or something of that nature. As soon as your sentence is, is, uh, is done, they call it once you're off papers, then you're eligible to register to vote again. Um, but while you're serving a felony sentence, including parole or probation, you're ineligible to both be registered or participate. And in fact, we uh, in Fayette County, a gentleman was charged with voting while on probation from a felony uh, and uh, also for illegal voter registration because he registered to vote while he was also on probation. He was convicted of the misdemeanor illegal voter registration uh, charge, but he was acquitted of the felony uh, illegal voting charge because it carries uh, an element of intent, 
And um, his defense was that uh, he wasn't aware. He wasn't eligible to vote. So he showed up to vote. He voted. Uh, he was told by the poll worker his name's not in the poll book. And um, he said, uh, well, I want to vote anyway. So they gave him a, a provisional ballot. The county commission refused to count it. And um, ultimately, he didn't. His vote wasn't counted, but the jury uh, found his story credible and acquitted him of that. Deke, a lot of information you're giving us, and I I'm, and I apologize. I'm going to ask for clarification on one. For voting, you you were discussing felony. Does that also apply, as you described it, also apply for misdemeanor? Only misdemeanor bribery in an election. Uh, I'm sorry for not parsing that out. That's what I meant earlier about. It's very similar. The only misdemeanor crime that prohibits or, or removes someone's eligibility to register and vote is bribery in an election. Um, and all of these, I should have said earlier, uh, also include treason. But treason is, is very specific and, and unique of itself, um, and, and uh, it applies to every office. If you're convicted of treason or a felony, it's the equivalent. Um, as far as eligibility goes. But the only misdemeanor that restricts your voting rights is bribery in an election. Is the restriction on voting made clear to uh, people when they're convicted and they're serving their crimes and they go out on parole? Is there part of a debriefing that says, oh, by the way, you're not allowed to vote? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've personally never gone through that process, but I've talked to parole officers and I've talked to several folks in the judiciary uh, and uh, in the reentry programs. Uh, even uh, when I was in law school, I did some work with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Northern District, and they have a, they have a person that actually coordinates reentry to make sure that the right information gets to the folks that are coming out of prison so they know what their rights are, what the restrictions are, things of that nature. And part of that is voting rights. Um, there's, we created a pamphlet. Um, it's been several years, but the State Election Commission actually paid to have it printed, and um, the, the folks that ended up doing it were uh, current incarcerated uh, felons with uh, uh, prison industries that has a print shop. But we worked with the ACLU and a couple other groups to, to craft this language that made sure that when they get out, they get this handout that's easy to read, easy to understand, what you can do, what you can't do. And uh, whether it's vote or register to vote um, and uh, have contact information for those folks to fill out. But when, you, when you're released, you go through like a class. It's, I don't know what they call it. I'll call it reentry class. But, um, and even while you're incarcerated, as you're leading up to your release date, there's, there's classes you can take and information that's given, you, uh, given to you, like how to get a driver's license, uh, how to um, – uh, register to vote, what your rights and restrictions are. If you have to check in with a, a PO, that's a good indication you're still on papers, so you can't register to vote then. But your parole officers, all of them around the state, also have this information. And when you're off papers and you sign off for the last time, you get handed a packet of information, so to speak. I don't know if this is how it happens literally, but you have the information at your disposal, and it's communicated to you expressly what you can and can't do. Um, and even in your sentencing, uh, order by the judge. The judge will put all this stuff in there. You can't have a firearm. You can't register to vote. You can't participate in an election. All that stuff is, is spelled out in various documents and handouts after you're incarcerated. Uh, at, uh, we have to let Deke go pretty soon, but okay. by the way, Bill, it's yeah, your final question. Yeah, very quick question, uh, and I think I know the answer, but uh, when you're talking about voting, you're talking about all voting, the federal and the state and the local levels, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, Certainly, the federal and the state rules are, are nearly exactly the same. Um, local authorities, specifically municipalities, do have some leeway to prescribe who can and who cannot participate in elections. A uh, hundred years ago, Bluefield had a restriction that you can't vote if you hadn't been a freeholder for a year. Um, but, but most of the time, municipalities follow the same uh, basic minimum criteria for statewide elections. Um, but if they wanted to put a restriction in there like this, uh, they would have to be sure that their council uh, did a good legal analysis and constitutional analysis of their charter, which is what they would have to amend to, to change what the, the, the current state requirements are at the municipal level because there's a section of code in the Constitution, I believe, that says any municipality that has a, uh, a, a provision of their charter or an ordinance that is contrary – to the laws of the state, that's the state code or the constitution, unless they're expressly permitted to amend those provisions, um, is is invalid, is void. So you can't 
you can't say something different than the Constitution or permit something that's pro- prohibited by the Constitution just because you're a municipality. And this very well may be one of those because you're prohibited, for example, um, from voting if you're currently serving a sentence for a felony. I don't know that the municipality has the authority to change that because it's in the Constitution. But once, you, once you've satisfied all those requirements of a felony conviction, once that expires, you may vote. Right. Exactly. All right. Deke, hey, great information today. I really appreciate you uh, taking both the HOA questions and these uh, voter and officeholder eligibility questions. Thank you, Rob. It's always a pleasure. And also, Deke, sometime down in the future, the 14th Amendment discussion would be appreciated as well because uh, starting in Colorado, and we're going to see a lot, of it, a lot of it on the news the next few weeks, and most of us do not fully understand the subtleties of what's being uh, uh, suggested here. Yeah, you're right, uh, and it's, it's very nuanced. Uh, and for those listening, if you're interested, the Colorado trial starts today, yeah. I believe, and on Thursday uh, there's a hearing in the Minnesota Supreme Court for the same issue. Thanks, Deke. Good stuff. Thanks, Deke. Thank you all. Legal counsel to the Secretary of State's Office, Deke Kersey, at uh, 935.